I'm pleased to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Dr. Abi Noam Pat, to launch Ottawa's Holocaust Education Month for 2017. Dr. Pat's lecture is titled, From Destruction to Rebirth, The Return of Life in the Jewish DP Camps. Dr. Pat is the Philip D. Feldman Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Maurice Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. He is also director of the Museum of Jewish Civilization. Before that, he worked as the Miles Lerman Applied Research Scholar for Jewish Life and Culture at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He received his PhD in Modern European History and Hebrew at Judaic and Judaic Studies from New York University. He's written or contributed to a number of books and articles on a variety of topics related to Jewish life and culture before, during, and after the Holocaust. Dr. Pat teaches courses on modern Jewish history, American Jewish history, responses to the Holocaust, the history of Zionism and the state of Israel, Jewish film, and modern Jewish literature, among others. Please welcome Dr. Avi Noam Pat. I would recommend holding the mic. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, it really is a pleasure for me to be here this evening with all of you. And I have to say, I'm, I'm so impressed by the program that has been uh, organized and by the work of the Center for Holocaust Education and Scholarship. Uh, I, I want to take a, a moment, I'm going to advance here, and thank all of the co-sponsors and the sponsors who have made this possible. Thank Mina for coordinating everything. Congratulate uh, our wonderful honoree, our teacher, Larry, for your impressive work that you've done, and uh, our, our children and grandchildren of survivors for uh, your work in continuing to teach and spread, uh, spread the lessons that have been learned and need to continue to be learned. So thank you to all of you for being here this evening. It sounds like I'm finishing my lecture, but I'm just getting started. Uh, so as, as you've heard, um, the, the subject of the lecture this evening is From Destruction to Rebirth, Jewish Life in the Aftermath of the Holocaust in Europe. And as you know, tonight we mark Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, as we've heard 79 years ago marking the events of November 9th and 10th, 1938. Now the topic of my lecture this evening is not on Kristallnacht itself, but is in fact on what I find to be an often overlooked but fascinating period of Jewish history, just seven years after the events of Kristallnacht, the return to Jewish life in the displaced persons camps of post-war Germany primarily in the years 1945 to 1948. That will be my focus this evening. And so there is a geographic link, but even more so there is a thematic link that we would do well to bear in mind today as we launch Holocaust Education Month. The theme of displacement of refugees and the experiences of refugees is one that carries through the period before, during, and after the war from Germany to Poland, to Jews throughout Europe, and eventually to the search for new homes in Israel, America, Canada, Australia, and countries around the globe. Now, as Mina mentioned, this is a topic which is incredibly current as well. And you can see here I have a slide that shows data on the current refugee crisis. This is statistics compiled by the United Nations High Commission on Refugees which counted that in the year 2015, there were approximately 65 million forcibly displaced people in the world, including 21 million refugees, the highest levels of displacement ever recorded. Now, of course, contemporary observers are quick to make comparisons between the refugee, the present refugee crisis, and the Jewish refugee crisis precipitated by the Nazi rise to power in the 1930s, and the outbreak of the Second World War, noting that restrictive immigration policies in the United States and in Canada as well, and, the, uh, and their echoes in current debates about immigration, 
and the plight of refugees. And now, as a historian, I know that we must always be cautious about drawing direct comparisons between distinct time periods. And my focus tonight is going to be specifically on the post-war period. Each period provides its own unique set of historical circumstances and complexities. And yet, there are several constants that remain. We can think about the challenges that confront the world in responding to crises of such magnitude. And most importantly, from the perspective of the refugees, we can assess the impact of statelessness on their actions, their behaviors. How does the experience of living in exile affect the displaced? How do international bodies try to address the concerns of refugees in such times of crisis? And more broadly, what is the responsibility of the international community to solve refugee crisis? Fundamentally, where are displaced people supposed to go? All too often, the history of the Holocaust and the period before, during, and after the war shows us that the world, organized according to an international filing system of citizenship, was ill-equipped to find a place for people who fell through the cracks of this system. Now, as has been discussed, the pre-war period exacerbated the situation of the Jewish refugees, in particular beginning with the Nazi rise to power in Germany in 1933. Anti-Semitic legislation that sought to remove German Jews from an economic, social, and cultural life created a refugee crisis that the international community was ill-equipped to handle. Between 1933 to 39, while over half of Germany's nearly 600,000 Jews were able to emigrate to other countries, attempts to develop an effective international response through first the Evian Conference, the creation of an inter intergovernmental committee on refugees, the organization of the Kinder Transport, and more, failed to reach a comprehensive solution, creating a sense among the Nazi leadership that their international community cared little for the fate of Jews under Nazi domination. You can see here on this map the process of Jewish emigration from Germany in the period before World War II, when approximately half of the 565,000 Jews living in Germany were able to leave, many going to Palestine, some to the United States, others to South America. And yet, the international community was ill-equipped to solve the problem of what to do with the remaining refugees, at least 250 to 300,000 in the Greater Reich by 1938. This slide shows a, uh, an illustration from the New York Times, July 3rd, 1938. Will the Evian Conference guide him to freed him? And you can see the Jewish refugee in the middle of the swastika with telling him, the Germans telling him to go, and at the end of every line of the swastika, a stop sign. The Evian Conference, which had been convened by President Roosevelt in response to mounting political pressure on the refugee situation in the summer of 1938 and the creation of the International Intergovernmental Committee of Refugees, enabled the German government to say how astounding it was that foreign countries criticized Germany for its treatment of the Jews, and yet not one of them was willing to open their doors. Following the nine-day meeting at Evian, when none of the 32 participant countries expressed any willingness to accept Jewish refugees, the only tangible uh, result was the creation of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, which was also unable to come up with a solution to the refugee crisis. And in a sense, this failure on the part of the international community to respond to the situation of the Jewish refugees emboldened the Nazi leadership in Germany to continue the process of displacement and ratchet up the treatment and the mistreatment of the Jews of Germany. Now, one of the precipitating factors that we talked about in the lead up to Kristallnacht was the story of Herschel Grinspan, who it's often not known, but his parents, what precipitated him to take this act was that his parents had been forcibly displaced as Polish Jewish citizens, forcibly displaced from Germany in the fall of 1938 and were left to languish on the border between Germany and Poland in a town called Zbanshin. Uh, 
and he heard these reports of the mistreatment and that there was no one who was going to take them in and they're in a hastily erected refugee camp on this border town of Zbanshin. And this is what led him to try to assassinate the diplomat in Paris, the precipitating event which led to the night of the broken glass, Kristallnacht. Now, some have speculated that one of the factors that led the Nazi regime to participate and take part in the state-sanctioned orchestration of violence in which we had the destruction of synagogues all over Germany, the destruction of thousands of Jewish homes and businesses, the murder of nearly 100 Jews on that night, and the rounding up of Jews, 25,000 to 30,000 sent to concentration camps. One of the precipitating factors was a realization on the part of the German regime, the Nazi regime, that no one really cared. That the, that the international community might wag their fingers at Germany, but that when it came down to it, they didn't really care how they were treating their Jews. And so they took this as a sign to embark on Kristallnacht, the nationwide pogrom of November 9th and 10th, 1938. And here you can see some images from Zbanshin uh, and Emmanuel Ringelblum, who some of you may know as the historian of the Warsaw Ghetto who created the Underground Archive, but was also an activist for the Joint Distribution Committee who went to Zbanshin to try to organize the refugees. And this motivation to try to organize refugees on the part of the Jewish community is part of the story that I want to tell tonight. Now we know that even after Kristallnacht, while the kinder transport was able to be organized and 10,000 children were taken out of Germany and Austria and Czechoslovakia and brought to England, that the international community was still largely unwilling to do anything for the Jewish refugees of Germany. Now I heard mentioned tonight of one of the refugees who departed uh, on the voyage of the St. Louis. And the St. Louis is a perfect example of the sense of the indifference of the international community. This boat carrying 937 passengers, almost all Jews fleeing the Third Reich, which as we heard departed from Hamburg on May, uh, in May of 1939, Many of you may be familiar with the story of this boat which voyaged across the Atlantic for two weeks, reached Havana only to find out that they were not going to be allowed to disembark, that they had been given uh, fake uh, visas, turned around, forced to leave Havana, trying to go to uh, Miami, which was only 90 miles away from Havana. The State Department would not allow them to uh, reach Havana. And from the Canadian perspective, there's also a part to this story as well. The attempt to reach Halifax also denied, and the ship, as we know, sailed back to Europe on June 6, 1939, with the, nine, with the 900 passengers being split up between four countries, an agreement that was negotiated by the Joint Distribution Committee, which played a crucial role in the fate of where those passengers would end up. Great Britain taking 288 passengers, the Netherlands 181, Belgium 214, and 224 reaching France. Now, as we know, three of those countries would come under German occupation within one year, and approximately half of those passengers who were in the occupied areas, about 254, we know, died during the war. So if anything, this gives us a sense for the consequences of the indifference of the international community to the plight of the Jewish refugees before the war. Now this sets the context for how the beginning of the war created a whole new set of political and financial challenges that dwarfed the refugee crisis of the 1930s. And while Jewish organizations struggled to coordinate the response to the overwhelming demands for help, it became quite clear that there was no one who was going to be willing to help the Jewish refugees, those who attempted to flee from with the invasion of Poland to the east, some making it to Lithuania, some uh, with the help of principal diplomats able to make their way further to the east, some to Japan, Shanghai, and elsewhere. This sets the scene, though, for the situation of the refugees and displaced persons 
in the aftermath of the war, which is going to be the focus of my remarks this evening. Now, if we think about this, the failure of the international community to address the refugee crisis after the war, uh, before the war, it becomes all the more striking how ill-prepared the international community was to deal with the refugee crisis, which would emerge in the aftermath of the war. Despite years of preparing for the defeat of Germany and the prospect of large numbers of displaced people, di people displaced by the war, the liberating armies and the international community proved broadly unprepared to cope with the large numbers of displaced persons created by the war. Here we are now, marking Kristallnacht, 72 years after the end of the war. And what I'd like to focus on is the situation of the refugees, but also the resilience of the surviving population, which in many respects took this lesson to heart and decided that if they were abandoned and alone after the war, then they would take care of themselves. And we'll see among the surviving population of Jewish DPs after the war, a fierce independence, a resilience, a resolve that if the international community didn't care about them, then they would take care of matters themselves and they would address their own needs in the aftermath of the war. Now you can see here, this is an image. I know that uh, Canadian soldiers participated in the liberation both of Vesterbork and some were at the liberation of Bergen-Belsen on April 15th, 1945. And what they found there was a population ravaged by disease, terrible hygienic state, many who died in the aftermath of the war, even after liberation from disease which had become rampant. You can see here on this map the process of the liberation of Germany at the end of the war with allied forces advancing from the west, the Red Army and Soviet forces advancing from the east, and the liberation of the major camps including Bergen-Belsen to the north, uh, Buchenwald in April of 45, Ordruf, Flossenburg, Dachau, and elsewhere, Theresienstadt among the last sites to be liberated by the Red Army in May of 1945. Now, I know, and we've heard the site mentioned already, many of you are probably familiar with the concentration camp of Buchenwald, liberated on April 11th, 1945. The camp, built by the Nazis in 1937, which was one of the largest concentration camps, stirs all sorts of associations and images. And after Kristallnacht, almost 10,000 Jews had been sent there, and during the war it became a major center of forced labor, with over 100,000 prisoners in its subcamp system by February of 1945. Upon seeing Buchenwald, Liberated on April 11, 1945, a member of the U.S. Army 333rd Engineering Regiment stated, My feeling was this was the most shattering experience of my life. A U.S. Army chaplain tried to make sense of the carnage and wrote home to his wife, This was a hell on earth if there ever was one. After photographing Buchenwald, Margaret Bork White wrote to her editor at Life magazine, the sights that I have just seen are so unbelievable, I don't think I'll believe them myself until I've seen the photographs. Another American journalist wrote, Buchenwald is beyond all comprehension. You, can't, you just can't understand it even when you've seen it. In the case of the aptly named kibbutz Buchenwald, just a few days, sorry, uh, there's a story, though, about Kibbutz Buchenwald. I don't have the slide here. It's okay. I'm going to tell you a little bit later about something that you probably have not heard about Buchenwald, and that is the story of a place that's known as Kibbutz Buchenwald. Now, we heard earlier tonight about Kibbutzim that were created in Germany before the war, but I'm going to tell you the story about a Kibbutz that was formed in Germany after the war. This is a kibbutz hachshara that survivors of the Buchenwald concentration camp decided that rather than remain in the, what was left of the concentration camp after liberation, that they would take it upon themselves as Zionist youth who have been liberated by the camp to take over a farm which was on a Nazi estate near Egendorf 
and they named it Kibbutz Buchenwald, and they would work the land of Germany until they could make Aliyah to the land of Israel. They decided that rather than remain in a camp for one day longer, they would return to a farm, they would take control over their lives again. Now this story of the farms is a fascinating story and it's one that I write about in my book about Zionist youth after the war because this was not an isolated case. There ended up being about 40 of these agricultural training farms, like the one that Shira mentioned before, 40 of these farms were opened all over Germany in the aftermath of the war. Thousands of young people decided that rather than remain in what was a refugee camp, a DP camp, they would move out to these farms. These young survivors who formed Kibbutz Buchenwald kept a diary of their experiences in the first weeks after liberation. And what they wrote described some of the sense of chaos and disorientation of those first few weeks. Now that they had been liberated, now that they knew that they had some sense of control over their lives again, they wrote in the diary, we suddenly faced ourselves. Where now? Where to? We saw that we were different from all the other inmates of the camp. For them, things were, for us, things were not so simple. To go back to Poland, to Hungary, to streets empty of Jews, towns empty of Jews, a world without Jews, to wander in those streets, those lands, lonely, homeless, always with the tragedy before one's eyes and to meet again a former Gentile neighbor who would open his eyes and smile, remarking with double meaning, what, Yanko, you're still alive? Yes, the Jews faced themselves. Was our tragedy only beginning? And as a number of Jewish survivors of Buchenwald wrote soon after liberation, in the wake of terrible destruction, the future was uncertain. And yet, despite this disorder and confusion, the surviving Jewish population quickly organized itself, asserting its presence, vitality, and resilience. Now, I'll just show you this image I was showing you before. It was an American Jewish chaplain, Rabbi Herschel Schachter, conducting, this was Pesach Sheni, second Passover services, which took place in May of 1945 at Buchenwald. Um, this is a map, which I'll explain, this is a map which shows you post-war Germany and the DP camps in post-war Germany. And what you can see here is Germany was divided into four zones of occupation. Um, the green zone in the top left of the map of Germany was the British zone. The purple zone was a French zone. And the largest number of Jewish DP camps would end up being in the American zone of occupation which, as I will discuss, actually had very significant political ramifications after the war. There was a pink zone in the top right, which you can see there, that was the Soviet zone of occupation. Many Jews who exited out of Poland crossed through the Soviet zone, but uh, the Soviets didn't really consider anyone who ended up in their zone to be displaced, and so uh, many Jews did not want to remain in the Soviet zone of occupation. Now, in the first days and weeks, following the liberation of Germany by Allied forces, you have to picture a scene where the country is inundated with liberated captives of the regime who wanted to make sense of their new situation. There were probably, by some estimates, at least 10 million forced laborers, POWs, and other non-Jewish displaced persons flooding the roads of Germany in the desire to return home, right? So just imagine masses of people, the war is over, the Germans have relocated, millions of forced laborers, POWs, displaced people uh, who want to return home. And among them, we have a very small Jewish population, maybe about 50,000 who survived in Germany at the end of the war, liberated from the camps. And some estimates are that several thousand died in the first few weeks after liberation, either from the years of mistreatment, malnourishment, disease, or in some cases from uh, mistreatment at the hands of the uh, liberating forces who didn't know how to, how to treat uh, the survivors after the war. Immediately following liberation, 
while most of these 10 million other displaced people and refugees and POWs were able to return home, the Jewish DPs did not face such a clear decision. As the survivors from Buchenwald noted, they didn't know what awaited them at home. And they were fairly certain that their families had been destroyed during the war. But those who decided to remain in a DP camp in Germany also had to face a fact, which meant that they were probably going to be still living among other non-Jews and in some cases former collaborators from their homelands who they might be living with in the DP camp. See, in the, origin, in the initial period, the, de the definition of a displaced person was a civilian outside the national boundaries of their country by reason of war who are desirous but unable to return home or find homes without assistance or to be returned home, returned to enemy or ex-enemy territory. And this was keeping with allied policy, which defined and organized people according to their place of national origin. The problem was that Jewish DPs were not recognized as a separate national category. So this meant that Jewish DPs from Poland would be housed with Polish DPs and Lithuanian DPs and Ukrainian DPs and etc. And you could see the complications that might arise from this sort of a situation. On top of this, Jewish DPs who made the decision to remain in Germany faced a choice. They could remain in a DP camp, which in some cases were former German military barracks or POW and slave labor camps, sometimes tent cities that have been hastily erected or industrial housing that had been taken over or they could decide that they would resettle in a German Jewish community, but this also meant that they were making the choice to live in Germany, of all places. You can see the dilemma. German Jews and about 15,000 German Jewish survivors did make the decision to return to their homes and their communities after the war. Now, among those, the most significant figures in the DP camps in the early period after the war was an American Jewish chaplain by the name of Abraham Klausner. And the story of Abe Klausner is one that, that I find incredibly fascinating. I wrote an article about him because I was so fascinated by his biography. Klausner was uh, about 30 years old at the time of this picture. He was a reform rabbi who had been trained at the Hebrew Union College, and he became a chaplain after he graduated from uh, the Hebrew Union College, and in the fall of 1944 had been stationed in northern France. He could see by the beginning of 1945 that the war was coming to an end in Europe, in the European theater, and so he wrote home to uh, his supervisor, a rabbi by the name of Philip Bernstein, who was also in charge of the chaplains and the Jewish service, and said, perhaps I can be stationed in the Asian theater. Maybe you can send me to the Pacific theater and I'll go minister to our troops in the Pacific theater. And Bernstein said, you should stay in Europe. You might be needed there. Well, in April of 1945, Klausner, who's still in Northern France, gets a message. And it's a very curious message from a group of American soldiers in Munich. And the message says, we need a rabbi down here. We've found a congregation of Jews. And he doesn't know what this means. So Klausner goes down, and what they're referring to is that they've liberated the camp of Dachau. Klausner goes to Dachau, and he's, among, he's the second rabbi to set foot in Dachau. Actually, the chaplains who were with the American military played a very important role in helping the survivors get organized after the war. And he goes to Dachau. And one of the first things that he describes in his memoirs and testimonies after the war is he went into a, a barrack in Dachau and there were prisoners in, still in the barrack and some, a voice called to him from one of the top bunks and said uh, in, in, to him in Yiddish, are, are you an American? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, are you Jewish? And he said, yes. And he said, actually, can't my brother, maybe you know my brother. And he's thinking to himself, what are the odds, you know? And he says, okay, who's your brother? And he says, well, his name is Rabbi Abraham Spiro, and he's a chaplain in the American army. And Klausner says, I do know your brother, and he's here in Germany. And so one of the first things that Klausner was able to do after he got to Dachau was to reunite these two brothers. And he took it upon himself 
to organize what would become a tracing service for the survivors in post-war Germany, basically to begin taking lists of names, right? Who had survived? Because this was the first priority for survivors. Finding out who had survived, getting reconnected with family. So Klausner, you can see him here in this picture and his fatigues with other survivors. This is a picture in Munich. Starts creating these lists of survivors and he calls it Sherit Hapleta. Now Sherit Hapleta or Sheris Hapleta is a biblical term. It refers to the prophecy that at the end of days or after the terrible destruction, there will be a surviving remnant, a remnant that will have survived. And Klausner, who was particularly, uh, had a particular affinity for the prophets, seized upon this idea that the remnant that he had found in Germany was the surviving remnant. And so he uh, commandeered the military mail service. He uh, you know, defied all kinds of rules. He got a printing press. In fact, the printer that he was able to use to get the press that was the printing press that printed Sherita Pleta, he was in Munich. And near Munich, the largest DP camp that would house the, house the most number of Jews outside of Munich was Landsberg. Now Landsberg, some of you might be familiar with the place, Landsberg was also the place where a revolutionary in 1923 who had tried to stage a putsch to overthrow the Bavarian uh, regional government, Adolf Hitler, was in prison for six months in the prison in Landsberg. And so Klausner used the same printing press that printed Mein Kampf in 1924 to print the lists of the names of Jews after the war, this Shevet Pleta. Klausner, I'll go back to a picture of him here, traveled around Germany to visit the DP camps in the first weeks after he got there in May and June of 1945. And what he discovered was a situation that horrified him. He probably saw about 15,000 Jews living in 17 DP camps that he visited, finding deplorable conditions, poor accommodations, no plumbing, no clothing, rampant disease, continuing malnourishment, and basically the lack of any plan on the part of the American military. He wrote this all up in a report to his superior, Philip Bernstein, and he concluded his report by describing the Jewish survivors as liberated, but not free. That is the paradox of the Jew. And Klausner took upon himself to do anything that he could to basically help the survivors to get organized. He met uh, one survivor uh, from Kovno in the Santo Tilien uh, DP camp, which had been a, a hospital. Uh, this was an, a survivor, a Lithuanian Jew by the name of Zalman Grinberg. And he worked together with Zalman Grinberg, who became one of the first leaders of the surviving Jewish population, helping to form what would become known as the Central Committee of Liberated Jews. Because the Jewish DPs realized that if no one was going to come help them, they would have to organize themselves to create a political body to speak on their own behalf before the military authorities. Now, in response to the reports that have been emanating from Germany about the lack of any plan and the continuing mistreatment of the Jewish DPs, President Truman, who was now president of the United States, Truman dispatched an emissary by the name of Earl Harrison. Earl Harrison had been a minister for refugees in the pre-war period, was considered something of, a re of an expert on the refugee problem, and so he was sent to the DP camps to assess the situation. And Harrison traveled around post-war Germany in July of 1945, visiting many of the DP camps in the American zone, and he also, here you can see him, visiting Bergen-Belsen in the British zone. And what he found also appalled him. And he wrote this up in a report which was published in September of 1945, The Plight of the Displaced Jews in Europe, the document that stirred the world, you can see it there, Earl Harrison's report to President Truman. In his report, he stated that we, the Americans, are, appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. 
They are in concentration camps in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. Now you can imagine the impact that a report like this would have. This idea that here the Americans had liberated the Jews, but the lack of any plan and the continuing mistreatment meant that conditions were not improving. And so Harrison made a series of very important recommendations which were put into effect. He proposed, first and foremost, that Jews be put into their own separate Jewish DP camps. He considered it unacceptable that they should be housed with other DPs of other nationalities, people who had maybe been their former persecutors, collaborators. Jewish DPs needed their own separate Jewish DP camps. He also recommended that an advisor for Jewish affairs be created, somebody who could be an interlocutor, who could speak to the Jewish representatives, could basically translate their needs for the American government, could work together with the Joint Distribution Committee, which only gained entrance to the DP camps in August of 45, basically after Harrison's visit. And he made one very other important recommendation. He said, there's a very easy way to solve the problem of the Jewish displaced persons. All of them, the ones that I've interviewed, all tell me when I ask them, where do you want to go? They say, I want to go to the land of Israel. And so the solution to the Jewish DP problem for Harrison was very clear. Let's give them 100,000 immigration certificates to Palestine and we'll solve the DP problem once and for all. Now you can imagine who was not so enthusiastic about this suggestion the British. Now the British had a number of issues on their hands, clearly the situation in Palestine, which if you remember the white paper which had been in effect since May of 1939 and was limiting Jewish migration to Palestine, the blockade was still in effect after the war. The limits on Jewish migration were still in effect limiting Jewish migration to Palestine. And they didn't want to recognize Jews as separate DPs. They didn't want to recognize the national claims of the Jews, right? But at the same time, the British were indebted to the Americans. And so in typical fashion, they didn't want to say no. So they said, let's create a commission of inquiry, which is what they did. And so they created something that was called the Anglo-American Commission of Inquiry, which was tasked with assessing the situation of the surviving Jewish population in Europe after the war and coming up with a solution to their condition. And so the Anglo-American Commission, which had five American representatives, five British representatives, the Brits thought, okay, this will sort of even things out, surveyed the Jews in the DP camps, traveled around Poland to assess the situation of the surviving Jewish population in Poland, and much to the chagrin of the British government, in April of 1946, the Anglo-American Committee also recommended 100,000 certificates be granted to the surviving Jewish population. Now, as we all know, although this recommendation was made in April of 46, nothing would happen. In 1947, the United Nations took up the problem of what to do with the surviving Jewish population, the problem of Palestine, and eventually, in many respects, the proposal to partition was based on the situation of the Jewish population. But I'll get back to that in a moment. After Harrison's visit, we can see the beginning of an organization, the Central Committee of Liberated Jews, which comes to, live, to, recognize, to, to represent the Jewish population. And we see that in these separate Jewish DP camps that are created, the Jewish survivors quickly create a fiercely independent political framework, which as you've heard, was ardently Zionist in nature. There was an overwhelming Zionist consensus among the surviving population. This did not mean that, as we know, every single DP would go to the land of Israel. But this was perfectly summed up by one survivor who when the Anglo-American Committee came around and they surveyed, and 95% of the DPs in these surveys, when they said, where do you want to go? They said, I want to go to Eretz Yisrael. I want to go to the land of Israel. So they tell a story about this one guy, Moshe, who they said, Moshe, we know you're going to Montevideo. You have certificates. You're going to South America. Why did you say you're going to, to Palestine? And he said, I may be able to live in South America, but the Jews need to live in the land of Israel. 
right? And this sort of encapsulated this idea of the conclusion that the survivors had reached after the war of the necessity of a Zionist conclusion. But what's amazing about the period, because what we end up having from the time that separate Jewish DP camps, and on this map, I'm just showing you another map with some of the major Jewish DP camps. It's probably hard for you to, to read here, but you can see you have places like Landsberg near Munich and Feldafing and Fernwald, which is also open to try to alleviate some of the overcrowding uh, and various Jewish DP camps that are opened all over the American zone of Germany in particular. What we see happening in this post-war period, these three years in particular from 1945 to 48, is the creation of an incredibly vibrant culture that is created in the DP camps. Educational systems, political systems, religious systems, cultural life. It is a fascinating microcosm of sort of the European Jewish population that had survived, that congregated itself in the DP camps of post-war Germany, and that really affirmed this idea of mir sein in do, right? We are here. This desire to continue Jewish life in the aftermath. I want to show you some, some examples of this. Um, a lot of people ask me, so what was the nature of, how did, how did things work there? Well, this picture sort of encapsulates that you have the American authorities who are still very much in charge of this zone of occupation. You have the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, which is tasked with administering all the different DP camps in the zones of occupation. And then you have the Joint Distribution Committee, and you can see a picture of Leo Schwartz, who was the head of the JVC's American Zone Operations in 1946. The Joint, which was really tasked with basically filling in the gaps for the American authorities and providing tremendous amounts. I mean, they raised millions and millions of dollars in 1946 alone to provide for the Jewish DPs in Germany after the war. But what we also see developing in this period, and you can see it in relations with uh, the JDC and the Central Committee, is that the Central Committee would constantly affirm the idea that we will decide what our surviving population gets. We are in charge of ourselves. You provide us with the goods and we'll distribute it, right? And this was this sort of independence that was affirmed. You can see here in this picture, October of 1945, David Ben-Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, comes to visit the DP camps. Now, a lot of people will ask, the Zionism in the DP camps, sort of this ardent Zionist enthusiasm, was that something that was brought from the Yishuv? Was that something that Jewish agency emissaries brought with them? And one of the things that's fascinating is that when Ben-Gurion came to visit the DP camps in the fall of 1945, and here you can see him in this picture, he's in the middle with the white hair, of course, meeting Major Irving Haymont, who was the director of the Landsberg DP camp. And then just to the left is our friend Abe Klausner, who was always, he always found his way into the most important places, and he really orchestrated a lot of these meetings. When Ben-Gurion came to Landsberg, when he came to the DP camps, and he was greeted like a king, he was overwhelmed by what he saw there. I don't think he expected to see this level of Zionist enthusiasm on the part of the surviving population. The authorities in the Yishuv had no idea on what the nature of the surviving population was, who had survived, or whether they would embrace Zionism. But he also realized that if the Zionist dream was going to become a reality, the population that had survived in Europe was going to be essential. He was going to need them to make Aliyah. They were going to be the population that would address what was essentially a demographic crisis in the Yishuv. The Jews in Palestine were still outnumbered basically two to one. And so where were the immigrants going to come from? From Ben-Gurion's perspective, they were going to come from the surviving population in Europe. And so when he comes and he sees this, he essentially outlines a plan to bring as many surviving Jews as possible to the American zone of occupation. And this built on something that was already in existence, a group in post-war Poland that was known as the Bricha. The Bricha was the movement of escape, if you think of the word in Hebrew, Bricha, the movement of escape from Poland. 
And these were Jews who had decided that maybe they had gone back to Poland, maybe they had survived in Poland, maybe they liberated from camps, or they had been repatriated, and seeing the destruction of their communities, seeing that no families had survived, and also seeing that anti-Semitism persisted in post-war Poland, they were not going to stay. And so the Bricha organized uh, movements of departure, very often organized into kibbutz groups of Zionist youth movements. Approximately 110,000 Jews left with the Bricha between 19... 46 into 1947. So that surviving population that I mentioned before of 50,000 Jews in the DP camps in 45, by 1947 there are 250,000 Jewish DPs in camps in Germany, Austria, and Italy. Right? And so again, this problem of displacement, the refugee population, is only growing. Now, why were the authorities so convinced that Zionism was the solution to their problems? Well, in some sense, it was made very clear by the surviving population. And I'll show you this picture as, as an example of this. This is one of those farms that I mentioned before, one of these kibbutz hachshara, one of these agricultural training farms. And this was a kibbutz that was called kibbutz nili. Now, kibbutz nili, if you know the acronym, stands for Netzach Yisrael lo yishakir. The eternal strength of Israel shall not be belied. Right? It's a biblical acronym. And this is what they named their kibbutz. And you can see these young people, young survivors, this is barely a year after liberation, smiling, happy, going out to work. This is a posed shot that was certainly used probably for I wouldn't be surprised if the joint used it for fundraising, right? That was part of the the deal here. But it's also, this is an incredible story of this kibbutz because this kibbutz, here you can see them, this is the first Passover Seder at Kibbutz Nili. Now think about this, this is April of 1946, the first Passover that's being observed in liberated Germany. And here they are, marking the Festival of Freedom, right? On the wall behind them, you can't see it here in this picture, but just above, it says, Mishiabut Legula, from slavery to redemption. And the idea, the first Passover after liberation in Germany was an incredibly symbolic holiday, right? And you see Haggadot, there was a Haggadah that's called the Survivor's Haggadah, which is basically rewritten with the language of the new pyramids the new slaves. Instead of the pyramids of Egypt, instead of the slavery of Egypt, we have bondage in the camps of Buchenwald and Dachau and the enslavement of the Jews in the camps and elsewhere. Now, Nili is taken, and all these Zionist youth, is taken as a symbol of sort of the Zionist conclusion, right? These young people are ardent and enthusiastic. And here you can see a young person, they renamed all of the buildings with Hebrew names, and uh, they renamed all the animals with Hebrew names. And you can see somebody here from UNRWA watching and observing them. But I point this example out because this was not just any training farm. Kibbutz Nili was situated on a farm that was called Pleichershof. And Pleichershof was located, it was the estate of the Nazi Julius Streicher. Julius Streicher, who was the editor and publisher of Der Sturmer, the foremost anti-Semitic newspaper published in Germany, which had on its masthead, Die Juden, die Juden seinen unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune. So think about this. Here we have Streicher standing trial at Nuremberg, one of those who would be executed at Nuremberg, and on his farm, these young people who have taken it over, turning it into a Zionist training farm, right? This is a type of revenge, right? A type of symbolic revenge. And they knew it, right? They understood it in that way. As I mentioned, there were 40 of these different kinds of training farms. Here's another one in Hochland. Zionist youth had a a large presence in the DP camps, marching through the streets, participating in demonstrations. Um, And we can also see, I'm just going to skip through some of these, that the surviving population changes in many ways with the arrival of large numbers of DPs, where from not just from Poland, but surviving Jews who have come from Hungary, 
from Romania, from Czechoslovakia, and some from the far reaches of the Soviet Union. And so, whereas the surviving population of 45 have been liberated from the concentration camps, it becomes a very diverse population by uh, 1947. We also see weddings taking place in the DP camps, right? Um, I'm sure there are some among us here who maybe were born in a DP camp. Yes, anyone born in a DP camp? Yes, okay, some DP babies, welcome. So uh, it's not surprising because one of the responses to the destruction after the war, even for those who had lost their families during the war, was to very quickly remarry and uh, start new families after the war. And I think in some way, this is a ketubah, but you can see there are so many pictures like this of babies being paraded through the streets of the DP camps, right? Um, and there was literally a baby boom in the Jewish DP camps in 1946 into 47. By some estimates, the survivors in the DP camps in post-war Germany had the highest per capita birth rate of any group in the world in that year, right? So my, my colleague, Atina Grossman, who teaches at Cooper Union, she calls it biological revenge, right? <laughs> this idea that sort of, again, mir sein und do, we are here, this strong drive to continue Jewish life after the war. Yes? Okay, maybe we'll discuss in the Q&A. Okay, uh, this idea of standing up for ourselves. We'll discuss. It raises an interesting, an interesting point. Um, more pictures of, of babies after the war. This is in Austria. This is in, in, a, in a DP camp in Italy. There's a vibrant Jewish press that is created in the DP camps as well. And you can see this is a DP camp newspaper in Neufreimann called Bamidbar. And again, the symbolism, right? Think about the symbolism. We have been liberated, but we're not yet free. We have been liberated from the camps, we have been liberated from enslavement in Egypt, but we are still in the wilderness. We are still Bamidbar until we make it to the Promised Land. Um, there is also a very strong sentiment, you can see it here from the Zionist Youth Movement of Shomer Tzair's newspaper, focused on celebrating the resistance, celebrating the Jewish participation in the resistance. The third anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, April 19, 1946, was taken as a symbol of this idea that the Jewish people, yes, they had stood up for themselves, yes, they had engaged in armed resistance, they had fought back, but in the very Zionist environment of the DP camps, the work was not done yet. That this battle, which had started in Warsaw, would be concluded with the creation of the State of Israel. So you can see this celebrated. You can see some of these announcements. This was the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a poster. And of course, uh, sports was also, I mean, people needed something to do with their time. Celebration of a return to health of Jewish bodies. Boxing was a popular sport. Here's a poster for a tennis match, uh, which took place in DP camps in Feldafing, uh, Landsberg, and, and elsewhere. And of course, vocational training workshops, which were created in the DP camps to propel, prepare the survivors for their new lives wherever they were going to go to. Survivors were also among the first historians of the Shoah. And this is a very important point, which is that historical commissions that were created in the DP camps were dedicated to writing the history of what had helped happened during the war. So you can see here, this is a poster from one of the DP camps, Help schreiben die Geschichte von letzten Choben. Help write the history of the most recent destruction. This is a, a historical commission uh, von letzten Choben, their publication, which started collecting testimonies after, after the war. Um, let me just pause that so it stops advancing. Uh, I can go on, there's all sorts of examples. Holiday celebrations, this is Purim in Landsberg. And you could see what this young man is dressed up as for Purim. Uh, and again, in the Purim in March of 1946 in Landsberg, the description was that yes, this was a festival celebrating the defeat of Haman, 
But it was also very much, you have Hitler's hanging in effigy everywhere, right? It was sort of this idea that is reappropriated in this modern day celebration of Purim. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. We have, we have theater, we have publications, we have religious life, which is reborn in the DP camps. This is in Ferenwald, where yeshivas are opened. Uh, the first uh, army, the U.S. Army, helps to publish a Talmud. Uh, you can see a Rabbi Shmuel Yaakov Roz, chief rabbi of the American Zone, standing over the U.S. Army Talmud. And then, of course, we have the role that is played by the surviving population, ultimately in the creation of the State of Israel. And this is where I'm going to, to end off with this point at the end. Because, as I mentioned, even though we have these recommendations for the surviving population, that they should be allowed to go to the land of Israel, that they should be given certificates, it's not solved. And one year goes by, and two years go by, and now three years are coming up, and the DPs are continuing to languish. And it reinforces this idea that the stateless population is not going to be accommodated anywhere, that the United States is not changing its restrictive immigration policy, so we know Canada doesn't change its immigration policy. Most countries are still not willing to take in refugees, those same refugees from the pre-war period. And so the DPs, again, resolve that they will use themselves in this diplomatic struggle for the uh, solution to their stateless condition. The most famous example of this is the story of the Exodus. In July of 1947, when the United Nations Special Commission on Palestine is visiting Palestine to assess the situation, a ship of Holocaust survivors called Yitziat Europa, the exodus from Europe, 4,500 survivors on the boat, attempts to break the British blockade of Palestine. It's not like the movie with Paul Newman, if you're thinking of that exodus, because in that case, they make it. In this case, the boat is intercepted. You can see them here on a prison ship. They're put on a prison ship by the British called the Running Meat Park. And when they are not able to return to France, the British force them to disembark back in Hamburg, back in Germany. Now, while technically this is a failure in terms of breaking the British blockade, it is a huge coup for the DP cause in terms of public relations, in terms of turning opinion to the plight of the DPs. And the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine sees this, and this plays no small part in the UN's recommendation to partition Palestine, to create a Jewish state, which will be able to accommodate uh, the, the Jewish population, the DPs. And so we have this idea that's expressed ardently by the surviving population, we want to go home, we want to go back to our home in the land of Israel. Of course, it is one of the ironies of history that at the time when they're finally ready to go back to their home, it is going to take another war. And in many cases, we have survivors who end up going to fight in the war in May of 1948. And it's that war that ultimately creates that home that they have so longed for. But again, if we think about the theme of this evening, this idea of statelessness, but also the idea of the resilience of the Jewish population, we can see that the vibrancy of the Jewish DP population shows that in a remarkably short period after the war, not only on the political, social, and cultural level did survivors return to life, but on the religious and spiritual plane as well. This rebirth experienced by the DPs allowed them to come back to life not only as human beings, but as Jews as well. Thank you. Happy to take some questions. If you have a question, if you can come up to the front. Unfortunately, we don't have a floor microphone. But if you call it your question, then I'm sure Dr. Pat will be happy to answer it. Why don't we start with 
The question from over there, challenging your use of the word revenge. Okay. So, um, yeah, the question was about whether it's appropriate to use the term revenge. And you said you'd prefer this idea of standing up, right? Standing up against, standing up for ourselves. And, Okay, so what I'll say is that I agree with that statement, but I also will tell you that in the war, and then in the immediate aftermath of the war, there, I'm not speaking for all Jews, but there are some Jews who had a very strong desire, sorry to tell you, they had a very strong desire for revenge. And I can see this in testimonies that are expressed in Jews who take part in resistance organizations who felt this need to avenge the loss of their families, right? And, and so that's why I, I use that term for some, not for everyone, but there are some. The, the most famous example is Abba Kovner. Abba Kovner, who was one of the partisans in, in Vilna and uh, tried to create a resistance organization in the Vilna ghetto and then escaped to the forest outside of Vilna. And after the war, he created this organization that was called Nikama, Nikama, the Hebrew word for revenge. And this is what he was focused on. Fortunately, we could say that uh, he, he had a plan. His plan was to try to poison as many Germans as he could after the war. It was not successful. And there's various reasons that go into that. Some people in, in the Yishuv probably informed on him because they realized that it would not be a good plan for Jews after the war to engage in these acts of mass vengeance. But I'll say that, you know, we have to, after the war, we can't generalize. There are some who feel one way, some who feel another way. Thank you. Good. Yes, I can talk about me. Uh, I uh, wonder if you're aware of the uh, efforts made, uh, maybe as a result of the Emmy, Emmy Conference, to place uh, over a thousand Jews in the Dominican Republic. Uh. Yeah, so um, it, in case, I'll just repeat some of the components of it. The, this is an, an amazing story. I mean, there's all sorts of little known stories that historians are still writing about. So this is the story of some Jews who ended up uh, surviving the war by finding refuge in the Dominican Republic, specifically in a settlement that was called Sosua or Sosua. Um, so at the Evian conference, I said 32 countries, I said no one stood up. The truth is that one country did say that they'd be willing to take Jews, and that was the Dominican Republic. Um, and in the DR, now it's an interesting thing because you have to say that there were very complicated politics in the Dominican Republic that also had to do with racial politics, and so they liked the idea of bringing white European Jews who they thought would be really good for business, right? There was some anti-Semitic components here that sort of Jews could develop the economy. But be that as it may, right, it play, there is this settlement in Sosua that's an amazing story. So I'll just say that uh, Marion Kaplan, if anyone's interested in this, Marion Kaplan uh, is a historian at NYU who's written a wonderful book on this topic. Um, there was an exhibit at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York several years ago and it's a, it's a fascinating story. Actually, the, 
the Joint Distribution Committee ends up playing a role in helping to fund some of the Jews who end up finding refuge there, creating these farms. I mean, there's, there's an interesting dynamic here of, of Jewish farmers, right? Sort of this idea of, of the return to the land and finding sustenance. Um, that we can see in a number of these places. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, sure. So the question was, um, as uh, as someone who did you say you were born in a DP camp or you're yeah okay. So trying to find a database that has information on basically immigration um, from DP camps to uh, to Israel. Um, so I don't know of a database that has that, but I can tell you that um, in the, there's a couple of archives. At the Yivo archives in, in New York, um, there is a collection that's called the just DP Germany collection, Displaced Persons Camps Germany. And in those archives, they have lists uh, organized by DP camp, so by geographic location. So there are names lists for some of these places. I mean, it is kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack because it hasn't been indexed, it hasn't been put into a database. But um, it, it's one way to try to look. The names might appear on a list of people who were selected for Aliyah, for example. I've seen lists like that, um, especially compiled by uh, the Zionist groups, political parties, and youth movements. So um, it, that would be, I think, a good place to start. Um, actually, starting in the DP camps and not looking in the Israeli sources, which would be the other way to look. Sir, you had a question. First of all, please accept my apologies because my language is bad on your family. Uh, second, I want to say I'm so sorry about everything that Nazareth has happened with the uh, Jewish. I heard a lot of bad things about Jewish in my country because I'm a New York lady. Of course, you know, bad reputation about the Jewish, but I'm so sorry about that. I'm trying to discover where is the truth? What happened? Why do we are hating the Jewish? But no one answered to me or gave me the truth. Only in myself, when I came, in, uh, came here in Canada, I start to research and discover these people, of course, good people. Don't, I don't hate him. Should be understanding, should be supporting. Miserable thing, terrible thing happened to him. I, I don't deny this Holocaust, at least. My hope from you, at least, give us more information about Jewish and Holocaust. Because in this part, in Syria, in Middle East, in Iraq, for example, because I'm in, in Iraq, don't know about everything. Because our government always push a lot of mistake information about Jewish, about Israel, about Holocaust, always deny this. Again, I'm so sorry about the Jewish people. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that, and I want to thank you for, for coming this evening to, to learn more of this history. Um, and it is something, you know, we see here our, our friend who's a, a teacher who teaches the Holocaust, and we talk about why it is so important to teach this history, 
right, um, all over the world, right, and it's something that needs to continue to be taught in all sorts of places, uh, and it's one of the things, and I'm sure, um, you know, we, we agree on this, that it is a way to teach about creating societies that we would want to create, that we can create a society that's based on mutual understanding, respect, celebrating diversity, right, respect for basic human rights. I mean, I think we would agree that when we teach the Holocaust, we want to teach about empathy, we want to teach people to have understanding for one another, to know what it's like to be in another's shoes, to understand what discrimination and prejudice and bigotry and hatred can lead to. So I applaud you for taking this on, wanting to learn, and I hope that we can continue to teach this everywhere. It's time for one more question. Yes, please. Okay, great question. I'll repeat it. So, um, the question was two parts. One is to talk about statelessness. Um, what, what do I mean by statelessness? Have these people that I refer to, Jewish GPs, actually, in effect, been denationalized? Right? Have they lost their national, their national citizenship, their national place of origin? And then the second part was, and I'll broaden it out, about sort of these uh, DP acts, immigration acts that take place in the United States. It's 1950, it's changed, uh, you refer to the 1951 act. What happens to these people after that? So, yeah, the, the problem of statelessness, and I would submit to you that, you know, I started at the beginning of the evening talking about parallels between the refugee crisis in the 1930s and the refugee crisis today. The problem of statelessness of people who have been denationalized is a problem that continues until the present day, right? I mean, we talk about 65 million people in the world who are displaced, 21 million refugees. The idea that the international community still has not figured out, right? We, we still hold on to this idea of sort of nationalism and that people are organized according to national system of citizenship. What do you, have, what do, you do when somebody is either kicked out of their country, they're displaced, they lose. who takes care of them, right? And so, in this case of the Jewish DP camps, yes, essentially, um, you have people look in Germany, right? They have been, they've lost their German citizenship in the 1930s and into the 1930s. They no longer have the protection of the German state, right? So you, you don't, not only do you not have the protection of the state, you are a, a target for persecution, right? So that is out. Um, and certainly for the Polish Jews who basically, if you see that definition of the DPs, they cannot return to their home country because they fear for their lives, right? So again, they don't have the protection of their home country. Or they are refugees who have had to flee during the war, have reached the far reaches of the Soviet Union. I'm sure there's some people here whose families survived in places like Kazakhstan. And then after the war, right, where do they go? So they end up coming back. This is what I'm talking about. So when I mean stateless, I mean they literally do not have the protection of a state and they have nowhere to go. And so if we think about that in this way, that Zionism, you remember that guy who was supposed to go to Uruguay and he talks about Zionism as a solution. It's a solution to the problem of statelessness, right? It's, it's a solution to this dilemma after the war where he says, I can go to South America, but the Jewish people as a people need a solution to the problem of statelessness. That, that addresses that. Um, I'm gonna answer your second question in a little different way, which is, so we know that the United States changes its immigration policy in 1950, there's another DP Act in 51. Um, you know, if we look at it as a counterfactual, like what would have happened if the US had a more open immigration policy in 1945? Things would have been very different. Right? I think a lot of a lot of the DPs, you know, probably would have immediately immigrated to the United States. Uh, they probably had family there. They probably would have gone there. But it was very evident that this was not an option. We do know that 
about two-thirds of the surviving population that's in Germany ends up going to the land of Israel, and approximately one-third goes to the United States, and obviously that's a very gross, because I don't count, I didn't count in there those who go to Canada, and those who go to South Africa, and those who go to Australia, but that's a rough estimate, two-thirds, one-third. But it's a little more complicated than that, because in the 1950s, there are many survivors who went to Israel and then leave and go to the United States or to Australia or South Africa or Canada or elsewhere, right? So it shows you how complex this situation is and that when you think about, you know, people usually don't make decisions on the basis of ideology, right? It's very nice to say, I'll do this for an idea. They usually make very clear, practical decisions. Where is the best place? Where can I raise a family? Where can I be secure? Where do I have family to go to? Where can I get a job? Those kinds of things. And so immigration, you know, in many cases is determined by that. 